Okay, Shalom Aleichem, everyone. It's good to be back. Erev Shavuos. Um, so I just came from Stanford Hill. There's some people here. I really don't want to repeat the exact same shir. Um, first of all, we're learning with Fuah Shalema tonight for Shoshana Bas Miriam. She should have a complete Fuah Shalema. So today in, in Sphira, we know that after we say the Sphira, so um, the first day... The first day is um, Chesed Shebe Chesed, which is uh, the second night of, of Pesach. We say Chesed Shebe Chesed. And the 49th day, which is, um, sh- which is the, the last day before Shavuos, is Malchus Shebe Malchus, which is um, the end. Malchus Shebe Malchus, we get the Torah, stands for Mashiach, for Daman HaMelech. So it seems to be that this, this stairway, this, this climb that we have to... Um, so Kabbalah Satayra starts on the second night of Pesach and starts with Chesed Shebe Chesed. There's Teferis, there's Netzach, there's Hoy, there's Yisoyed. Um, so the question is, why do we need to start with Chesed Shebe Chesed to, um, to get Malchus Shebe Malchus? Why don't we start with Yisoyed? Yisoyed is foundation, or Hoyd. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, this bottom steer, which is the first steer that we get onto, to, uh, on this climb to Malchus Shebe Malchus, why it has to be why it has to be um, chesed shebe chesed. So, to, to really start talking about chesed, um, the one that we learn chesed from, of course, is Avram Avinu. We know that if you find a Jew that's not a, a, a B'nai Rachamim, that's not, that doesn't do achnas azarchim, and doesn't give tzedakah, it says you have to look in his, his background, where he comes from, because you'll probably find that he's not Jewish. Because there's a, there's a thing that we call spiritual DNA, that um, just like physical DNA, you, you have the color of your eyes, the color of your hair, the color of your skin, comes from your parents. Disease is chas v'shalom, um, there's in genetics and DNA, the, the longevity of a person's life. They ask you, how long has your father lived, your grandfather? So there's a lot going on in a person's, in a person's DNA. We know that everything in the physical world, as Zayar says, is copied, is mirrored in the spiritual world. So the thing called, this, the thing called spiritual DNA. We all have spiritual DNA. We all have DNA from Avram Avinu. The DNA we have from Avram Avinu is Chesed. So you find a Yid that doesn't have Chesed, it's a problem. We see many, many things in the Torah um, that are riots, that are proof to, to um, spiritual DNA. We see um, the Benay Salafchad, that they loved Eretz Yisrael, because Rashi says that they came from Yosef HaTzadik. We see a lot of different things in, in, in Klai Yisrael. And, and people who are actually able to, thank you, people that overcome certain midos, we give the strength to our children, which we're going to see tonight. Our children and our grandchildren, we give them a strength to be, to, if we're able to break the, that midah, if we're able to, to um, be victorious in that nisayin, then we don't even realize, but our grandchildren, great-grandchildren, when they have that nisayin, they're able to, um, they're able to. So we, when we do something right, or we do something wrong, you have to know it's not just you. You're, you're putting that in the spiritual DNA of your kids and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. So, Let's take a look at Pashas Vayera, where it starts with, of course, Avraham Avinu's Chesed. We'll try to learn tonight a little bit about what it means to do Chesed and why we read Rus. Why we read Rus on, uh, on Shavuos. So, so we know that the reasons that are brought down is uh, Rus with Hashem's name, with a hey spells Taira, right? Reish Vav Tov. And then if you add a hey to it, it spells Taira. So it's very nice. Rus was Makabal Omach Shemayim. So we put a hey to her name, it spells Taira. Very nice. If you take the name Rus, it was 606. Tough Reish Vav. Rus was a guy, so she had seven mitzvahs. B'nai Nayach. What was she makabal when she became a Giyaris? 606. Which equals 613. On Shuas were makabal the Torah, were makabal 613. That's where we, we read Rus. The problem with that is one of my students asked me what happens if her name was Miriam. So you wouldn't read the whole story? It's only because her name is Rus. So the whole story of Boaz and Dabar Melech and is based on her name. Her name was Miriam Machana. What would you do? You'd say, "Why are we reading it? Doesn't equal 606." It's a good question. So um, we're going to go into a little bit of a deeper reason why we read Rus on Shuris. So let's take a look at a mo- for a moment at Pasha Vayera. Let's go back. 
So it says, Ve'yeriel of Hashem Eleni Mamre, Hu Yeshe Pesach HaOyel. Rabbi Avinu was not mechaiv whatsoever in Achnas' Archim. It was the third day of his bris. He was sick. Chayla is potter. He was potter. He didn't have to do um, chesed. Hashem saw that. Hashem saw that chesed bothered him that he didn't do chesed more than his actual sickness. So, HaKadosh Baruch Hu took away the sun that was burning and he sent three malachim dressed up as human beings to, um, to make Avram believe that he needed to do chesed. So the chesed begins, and I, I just spoke, it's a little bit repetitive, I just spoke in, in Stanford Hill, I was explaining that it says, Vayisa Einov, that he lifted up his eyes, Vayar. So the chesed begins by Vayisa Einov. Some people say, if somebody needs help, I'm always going to be there for them. That's not chesed. Once they need help, if you're there for them, that's a favor. My wife, and her, I, every morning I bring her a coffee. Once in a while, when I wake up, I forget. This happened, that happened. I forget to bring her a coffee. So when I come home after davening, she's like, so what happened this morning? You didn't bring me a coffee. I'm like, why don't you just remind me when I came out of the bath, why don't you just tell me, by the way, Zachai, you forgot to bring me a coffee. She's like, because if I have to tell you, I have to ask you, then it's a favor. I'm not asking you, you have to do me a favor. If you want to do it, you can do it. Once I have to ask you, so when a person has to ask you to borrow money, when a person has to ask you for something, so you're doing them a favor. You ask me to borrow money, okay, I'm there for you. When, when you anticipate, that's real chesed. Chesed is anticipation. Marriage, relationship, is, is not when someone asks you for something that you, that you give it to them. That's a favor. A relationship is antis- anticipating the other person's needs. Before you ask me, I'm already doing it for you. So then, it's not a favor. That's a relationship. So here, the first thing before Vayar, before you could see anything, but you say, you know, you have to lift up your eyes. Because the Pasuk doesn't have to say, usually it says, Vayar Moshe. It doesn't say, Vayar Vaya Moshe. It doesn't usually use the words, Vayar Moshe. When it comes to Chesed, specifically, not when you're looking at something, not when you're looking at the ocean or a mountain or something. When it comes to Chesed, you must have the Vayar Enov. You have to lift your eyes out of your phone, out of your business, out of your personal life. You have to lift your eyes up. And if you lift your, li- your eyes up, what's the next word? Vaya. Then you'll see. So about two weeks ago, I was on a treadmill. Um, my daughter, Blaine and her, she got engaged. She's getting married June 25th. So my wife said, you got to lose weight. You got to look good for the pictures. So I'm like, okay, we're going to get on a treadmill. And I'm going to listen to Shiorim. I'm going to listen to some music, whatever I'm going to listen to. And I'm going to lose weight. And it was not much a lot of fun. Been doing it for a while. And um, two weeks ago, I was on the treadmill. I was running pretty fast. And um, all of a sudden, I felt something in my knee pop, crack. And um, I stopped running pretty fast. And uh, I, I realized that I did something. But it didn't make sense to me because it wasn't like I twisted my knee. I didn't fall. It just felt like something cracked. It was very weird. It was a weird feeling. But very, very, very painful. I could not step down on my foot. So I'm a little bit connected with people in the hospital. I right away ran to get an MRI. And we'll talk about the MRI in a few minutes. Um, it wasn't a good MRI. I was in a lot of pain. And they said I have to go to a big doctor the next day, a surgeon. And um, okay, so I had an appointment the next afternoon. I went to Dobbin by Landau's in, in Flatbush on East 8th. But if anyone knows anything about Landau's, it's almost impossible to find parking. So I ended up, Baruch Hashem, I found parking one block away. But I had a problem. I had these crutches. I never used them before. I don't know how to use crutches. And I have my tefillin, my talus bag. And I have my, my Rabbeinu Tams, my Rashis, my talus, my Mishnayis, my Kitzvah Shulchan Aruch, a um, couple of other things. It's a, heavy, it's a heavy weight. In fact, I learned a very big lesson because the week before this accident happened, my wife went to a store to buy my son-in-law, my future son-in-law, you have to buy him a talus, you have to buy him a talus bag, and you have to buy him a kittel, all the nice things, Baruch Hashem. So she's in the store, and she said, you know, they sell these bags that you put the talus in, and then you can wear it over your shoulder. It's like this new black bag, it's like a little bit of stick, like a knapsack, or whatever it is, it makes it easier to carry the tool. And I said, chas v'shalom, you dear buy that for him. I said, it's the biggest cherpa. Tefillin, you're supposed to hold in your hand on your heart. Not over your shoulder, not on your back. I said, would you dare buy that for me? Now, I, I passed on that myself. Nobody ever said that. I just, I just don't like when I see people walking into shul and they have this bag over their shoulder. You're supposed to carry the tefillin. 
So I told her not to buy it. Meanwhile, right now, because I have crutches, that's what I'm using. But, um, <laughs> but I'll tell you the story, what happened. So, so, it, so, so, it's, so it's Monday morning, I gotta go diving. And I get out of the car with these crutches. I'm like, where do you put the tefillin? Because I don't have that knapsack kind of bag. I have my tefillin in a plastic bag, you know, in the plastic zipper. So what am I going to do? And I'm like, but I got to get to shul. So, so I decide I'm going to take the plastic and I'm going to put it in my teeth. Right? I'm going to hold it in my teeth and I'm going to use the crutches and I'm going to go for the block with the crutches and the tefillin's going to be swinging back and forth and I hold, I'll be able to hold it tight enough that I won't drop it. But I had no choice, I didn't want to miss the minion. So I put this big huge talus bag in my teeth and I put these crutches that I have never used before and I'm trying to make my way down the street. You can imagine what it looked like. Right? Guy bent over with, with his big back, like just going back and forth. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm not going to be able to hold my mouth shut, first of all, that long, because I like to talk. And it's going to, how long can I carry this thing? And I'm realizing, I'm thinking to myself, as I start making it down the block, that I'm going to drop my tillum. And then I'm going to try to catch it. And then I'm going to drop my crutches. And then I'm going to fall on my face. My tillum, my crutches, Wallace is going to be laying all over the sidewalk. And you see people like, you're like, oh my gosh, what happened to this guy? Cars are going to stop. I'm going to be the biggest embarrassment. And all of a sudden, this guy walks out of shore. I'm like, oh, Baruch Hashem. He's going to take the tulin out of my mouth. And he just walks right by me. <laughs> right by me, like I don't exist. And I'm like, ah. you just came out of shul, right? You have this, in the new Sidurim, you say, before you start davening. I'm like, this is really nice. And I'm trying to tell him, mm-hmm. and I'm trying to get his attention. Garnished, walks right by me. He's on his Blackberry, like the whole world doesn't exist. I'm like, I'm just not going to make this. So I'm pretty much standing now, just going one step at a time, very slowly. And my tool is still swinging. And a guy comes out of shore that I know. I'm like, he will definitely help me. And he just walks right by me. He's texting. He didn't even see me. He's not, he doesn't even see me. I'm trying to make noises. Forget about it. I'm thinking to myself, what am I going to do? I, I have no kayak. It's slipping out of my mouth. My crutches, I don't know what I'm doing with them. I was like, Hashem, you got to help me here. And just like right that, Mamish, a guy came from behind. And he didn't know who I was. He said, let me help you. And he takes the tefillin out of my mouth. And I'm like, thank you. And he walks into shore with me, puts the tefillin down on the table. He says, listen, how long do you have to be on crutches? I'm like, I think four weeks. He says, what are you going to do every day? You're going to have a tefillin in your mouth? He says, let me give you my bag. And he had one of these over-the-shoulder palace bags. You know, the, the exact thing I asked my wife to buy. So he says, my name's inside. Use it till you feel better. And then call me. Unless you want me to go to Eichler's and buy you one. I'm like, no. Don't buy me one. Because I come home one, my wife's going to go, oh, your son-in-law wasn't good enough for you. It is good enough. I don't get to the whole thing. Like, don't buy me one. So, Manishtana. What's the difference between this guy and the other two guys? There's no Shiloh that the other two guys, would, if they would have seen me, especially the one who knew me, would have taken it out of my mouth and, and done exactly what this guy did. But they didn't even see me. Because there was no Vayisa Enov. They were busy with their own stuff. Their cell phone, their texting. So you have this guy walking down the street, falling off his crutches, filling in his mouth. And I happened to be that I caught up with this, my friend, and I said, did you see me Monday morning? He said, where? I'm like, I was down in this, I was walking down the sidewalk in crutches, with filling in my mouth. He goes, Zachari, I promise I didn't see you. I said, I should hope so. I said, but maybe when you come out of shore like for two minutes, you should detox. Like, don't go right to your phone, because maybe someone needs your help. Like, till you get into the car. I said, like, you know what? I walked right by you. I was about to fall on my face. He says, what are you talking about? You're making up stories. I'm like, no. I walked right by you. And you just, you just walked right by me. Like, I didn't exist. So what, what the Torah is telling us here is, that by Yisra Enav has to come first. You have to lift up your eyes out of your, out of your stuff. You're so busy with. Because if you don't do that, there's no vaya. You don't see your wife, you don't see your kids, you don't see nobody. You just see yourself. In order to see everyone else, the first person you have to remove from in front of your own eyes is yourself. So, that's what the Torah is telling us here. Vayisa Enov, he lifted up his eyes. Next word, vaya. What did he see? He saw three men standing all of, on him, in front of him. Okay, and then the same Pasuk says, Vayar, he saw, Vayarats across some, and he ran to meet them. First of all, what do you mean he saw? He already saw. What's the second Vayar? And what's the Vayarats across some? 
If they're standing right in front of him, needs of all of, then how's he running to meet them? What, he ran over them? If he ran to meet them, it means they were far away. So make up your mind, Pasuk. Were they needs of all of? Or were they Vayoetz across some? How can it be both? So, tonight's shear is really about the second Vayar. Everybody has the first Vayar. Everyone has the ability to see, to look at somebody and see exactly what he sees. He needs of all of This is the person. Very few people have the ability to look again. And if a person has the ability to look again, then it's Vayar Atzal Krasam. Then you have the ability to meet them, you have the ability to create a relationship. So I want to give you some examples. There's a store that I go shopping every Arab Shabbos. It's called Chapanash. It's in, it's in Flatbush. They have the most amazing coleslaw. It sounds funny. They're, the, they're known. Their coleslaw is great. People come just to buy their coleslaw. I don't know how you say coleslaw in, in London, but, but coleslaw. Anyway, so there's this lady that collects tzedakah outside every Friday morning. She did from the Friday morning mamish till they close. And she collects tzedakah. I don't know if she's from, she's not from, this little, tiny, blonde woman, old woman. And she collects the duck and she has this like coffee cup that's like really old paper coffee cup. So everybody likes to feel good, you know, you're spending four ninety nine for half a pound of coleslaw. And this lady's staying there, so people are tossing in quarters, sometimes 50 cents, sometimes a dollar. And I always want to feel good, good about myself, because I'm running around from this store to this store spending all money for Shabbos. So I give her a dollar. And I feel very good about it. She asks me, how are you? And she gives me brachas. And, you know, you give someone a dollar, it's like... So I felt very good about myself. And then a few years ago, when I went to, um, I put the dollar in her cup, across the street's a pizza shop. And this young 16, 17 year old girl comes across the street, and she has a hot coffee with a lid on it, and a, and a Danish. And she walks over to this woman, I just put the dollar in her cup. And she brings her this hot coffee and this Danish, and this woman's like, Thank you, Shefala, you're so sweet. And, and she doesn't have I forgot to tell him in my last. She says to me, Rabbi, Rabbi Wallenstein, you should know this girl brings me every week a Danish and a hot coffee. And I thought to myself for a moment, this woman who collects would never get up, never get up and go get herself a coffee. Because she's a poor lady and she thinks that when she goes across the street to get the Danish and coffee, she's going to miss eight, nine people. She's going to miss eight, nine dollars. So she sits there a whole day, scared to get up because if I get up, I'm going to, I'm going to lose business. So this girl understood that. No matter how much money you're going to put in her cup, she's not eating today because she's not getting up from that chair because she doesn't want to lose money. So this girl had a second vayar. And she saw that just putting a dollar is not enough. She went, went to the store, bought the Danish, bought the coffee, and gave it to the lady. Manishtana. I see a cup, there's a, there's a cup, and people are putting money in the cup, and I'm sure you see this in shul, how many of us are in shul, and there's people collecting, they're bothering you, because you're davening, right, you're davening, you're being bothered, right, you don't even look at them, you just hear someone shaking money in a hand, you don't realize that that cup is connected to a hand, and that hand is connected to a person. And that person has feelings. And that person is connected to Hashem. So when you just see a cup, you put a dollar in it. This 16, 17 year old girl saw past the cup. Saw a hand that holds the cup and a person that's holding is part of that, that hand is part of that person and that person is cold and that person is hungry. So putting a dollar in the cup is not enough. So she had the second vayah. The first vayah is Nitzavolov. She's sitting here, give her a dollar. The second vayah is vayarat. Look across them. Go run, get him a coffee. Get him a Danish. That's not just in poor people. That's in our wives' relationship. That's in our children. That's in being a teacher. The first look, 99% of the time, is wrong. It's the second look. 99% of the time that is right. So, I was telling a story that, so I'm a Rebbe for 34 years, 
And I have Baruch Hashem a very good relationship with the boys in my class. We play ball together, we go out to eat together, they come to my house for Shabbos, we climb mountains together, we actually learn together. Um, why I left that for last, okay, whatever. But we're really, really, really close. And I'm very careful to buy, I buy them a lot of food because the way to a guy's heart is, you know, through his stomach. So my boys were always very close to me because Rebbe, just, Rebbe fed them. And there was this um, cupcake that I used to pick up and bring to school every day for every kid in my, every boy in my class. A lot of chocolate on top, a lot of white cream in the middle. And of course they couldn't control themselves, so right after chakras, they all ate their cupcakes. But my cupcake I always left for after recess at 11 o'clock. Sat on my desk, I came upstairs with a tea, and I had my cupcake and my tea, and then we started learning. One day I come up, stairs after recess, and on my desk, is just the paper that the cupcake was in. So somebody ate the whole cupcake and left me the paper, the cupcake holder. So I went crazy. I went crazy. I give everything to you guys. I feed you. I take care of you. Who had the chutzpah to come up to my desk during recess and take my cupcake? I said, I remember screaming, you put your hand in my mouth, into my stomach, and you pull the cupcake out of it. I'm like, this is evil. This is not bad. Bad is putting a thumbtack on the Rebbe's desk, on the Rebbe's chair. That hurts. That's bad. That's mischievous. Pulling the fire alarm down. To go up, like, what is this kid thinking as he was eating it? What is he thinking? He's eating his Rebbe's cupcake. Like, what, what's the cheshman? I like the, what's the cheshman in your head? Come to me and say, Rebbe, I'm hungry. Could you buy me another cupcake? Can I have your cupcake? You couldn't wait two minutes to ask me? What were you thinking as you're munching, and, and, and I'm dreaming about this, like, as you're munching Rebbe's cupcake? Like, what are you thinking? Like, what's going through your head? Like, Rebbe doesn't need it. I don't care about Rebbe. It tastes better because it's Rebbe's cupcake. What's the deal? So I flew off the handle. And I'm like, this class is not having recess until the boy that ate my cupcake gets up and admits it. And we were three months till the end of the year. I said, I don't care for three months. There will be no recess from a quarter to 11 to 11. We will learn right through it until the guy admits whoever ate my cupcake. So of course the other kids are not gonna rat on the guy who did it. Some of them knew, some of them didn't. Um, so it came after class, before they went to English. This kid comes out and says, Rebbe, can I talk to you? Happened to have been a kid that I was very close to. I'm like, yeah, figuring he's gonna tell me who did it. He says, I ate your cupcake. I'm like, what? He says, yeah, I ate your cupcake. I'm like, first of all, the least you could have done is throw the paper out. Says, you ate my cupcake? After everything I did for you? You went into my mouth and took out my cupcake? You're sick! You're evil! What's wrong with you? I couldn't look at him. I couldn't look at him. I was like, oh, how dare you? I mean, Kafri Toiv is the worst me though. I was like, you, you stabbed me in the back. So he looks at me like I'm a little crazy because like, wow, it's just a cupcake. You know? And that's what he said, I think, under his breath, which made me even angrier. It's just a cupcake. Like, I said, really? Well, you're about to find out what a cupcake can do. I said, I do not want you in my class anymore. I cannot teach you because I don't believe that you could teach someone that you don't like. Therefore, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I can't teach you. You've got to go down a grade to seventh grade. Comes the end of the year, I'll let you graduate with, my, with the rest of the class. I can't see you anymore. The two of us, finito. It's over. I cannot sit and teach. I'm a Kayan, we have to bench by Ahava. There's no Ahava anymore. I, I can't understand what was going through your head. I don't hop. I went to the principal, I said, I don't want this kid in my class anymore. What did he do? He stole my cupcake. Sounds silly, right? <laughs> it's like if. You throw your mouth because he stole your cupcake? Like, hello, Rabbi, wake up, grow up. I was on fire. I was like, because I'm a client. You know, it's very hard to get me on fire, but you take my cupcake, that's it. So I send him to seventh grade. I go home. My wife sees a mama. I'm disturbed. If you love somebody and then they, they do something like this, it just, you can't get over it because it's like a cuff we told. It's like it gave you everything. One of the, one of the problems as parents that, you know, and, and, and many times we react the wrong way to our kids. It's because I give you everything. How could you do this to me? 
we take it personally. And, and, and I, I talk to a lot of parents and to a lot of teachers. There's no kid that, that does something wrong that says, I want to hurt my parents. Kid doesn't do that. He's mischievous. He wants to have a good time. Whatever reason. But they don't sit there and say, I want to hurt my parents. I want to hurt my teacher. What they're really doing is they're hurting themselves. So if we really knew that, we wouldn't get so angry. If we really understood that, we wouldn't get so angry. But I didn't understand that. So I came home and I was very perturbed. I was, I think I even said I might quit yeshiva. I was so upset this guy could do this to me. It's like, I put all this energy into this guy, and he eats my cupcake. As silly as it sounds, it's not the cupcake. You all understand. So my wife says to me, can I ask you a question? Because she's removed from this whole thing. I'm saying, yeah, sure. What, what's the question? She says, let's say your cupcake was still on your desk. But there was another kid in this class that saved his cupcake for after recess. And you came up, and that kid's cupcake is gone. And the kid's ranting and raving. Someone stole my cupcake! Rebbe, you gotta punish him! You gotta leave him back! I would say, are you crazy? It's a cupcake, get over it. I'll buy you another one tomorrow. It's a cupcake. We'll try to find the guy who did it. I'm sure he was very hungry. He'll buy you two cupcakes tomorrow. Don't get bent out of shape from a cupcake. Would I, would I have thrown that kid out to the end, of the end of the year and say, I can't look at you? Of course I could look at him. He didn't take my cupcake. So I would have punished him. We would have learned, learned a little bit about don't steal. He would have said he was hungry. I would have told the kid, don't be so makbid. Be Michael him. Be mad al You'll have to grow. Sometimes people take things that are yours. I would have given him a whole muster schmooze. So my wife said, so then why are you any different? Why are you reacting so drastically? It's so not you, Zacharia, to take a kid and leave him back for three months? And I looked at her and I said, you're right. If it was another kid's cupcake, I would not have reacted like this. But it's my cupcake. He took my cupcake. And that's because I didn't have a second Vayar. If I would have had a second look, I would have pulled this kid out and said, listen to the difference, same story. I would have said, me and you are very close. I've done a lot for you. Why would a boy that I've done so much for, and that I'm so close to, why would a kid like that go up to my desk and take my cupcake? So tell me, Yehuda, we're very close, why? And then he would have said either, I was really, really hungry, Rebbe. Or Rebbe, I didn't think you'd mind so much. <sighs> I, don't, I love you. I didn't do it to hurt you, Rebbe. I figured it's a cupcake, Rebbe. It wouldn't bother you so much. You could buy another one and you could get a lunch, whatever you want. I'm sorry, Rebbe, I didn't mean it. That would have been the whole thing. No blow up, no throwing out, no, no threatening. No, I can never look at you again. I, I decimated this child. I told him to his face, I can't look at you. I totally decimated him. Why? Why'd you decimate him? Because he did something to me. How dare you do this to me? That's the first vayar. Needs of all love. You're in my face. Get out of my face. The second vayar is vayar at Slakrasam. If you would have looked into it, you would realize he didn't think you would matter so much. He was hungry. He's going to tell you later. Then you could have been Rayyar Tsukrasan, you could have made a bigger friend. You could have said, even though you did this to me, it doesn't matter. So I came back the next day, of course, and I apologized, and I brought him back to my class. And of course, I made him buy me a, a cupcake that he owed me. But it was a very big lesson for me, and it was a very big lesson for my class. And a very big lesson in, in, in marriage and in, 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 in children and everything. And, and that's be, to be able to you know, have that second look. You know, in marriage, Sometimes we're sent to the store to get something, and we come back with the wrong thing. It's happened to me, you know, my wife sent me to get string beans, two cans of string beans for some salad, and I came back with sliced carrots in a can. And when I walked in, you know, the first thing she was like, I can't believe it, you didn't get me the string beans. You were on your phone, weren't you? When your friends ask you for something, you always get the right thing. You would never bring them the wrong thing. 
I don't count. That's why. And I'm like, <sighs> I went to the store, I waited online, I brought the wrong thing because it happens to be that the carrots were behind the string beans, and I don't, you never take the first two cans, right? You're always worried that some guy stuck a needle with some poison in those two cans, right? <laughs> so, so you take the, behind it, so without looking at it, I figured the string beans, behind it, string beans. But my wife's already saying like, you don't care, you don't care about me, that's it, our marriage is over. I'm like, hello, two cans, two cans of string beans, I'm back in the, I'm going back in the car, you guys know what I'm talking about. I'll be back in five minutes, I'll get you string beans. No, now I don't want them. <laughs> now I don't need them anymore. What are we going to do with these carrots? I don't want carrots either. If you would have asked me, I could have told you that I talk and went to the store and I love you very much and I care about you very much and I definitely did not do this on purpose. Why would I bring you something to aggravate you? It was the store's fault and if you want to come with me right now, you'll see that they put these carrots behind the string beans. That's not the way they're supposed to be. The guy comes home, his wife didn't make supper. He didn't sh when we don't get the things that we expect, from our kids, or from our wives, or from whatever it is, or from the people that work for us, the first look says, didn't get what I expected. Needs of all of It's on you. The second look says, maybe something's going on. Maybe, maybe I need to find out why this didn't happen. Maybe my worker is going through some marital problems or has a sick child. Maybe my wife did something she didn't tell me about with the kids, and that's why she was late today. The second look tells you so much more than the first look. I feel to this day bad what I did to that kid. I decimated him. I made up for him. I asked Mechil, whatever it is. But I, mamish, I told him, I can't look at you. I can't even believe that came out of my mouth. I'm the Kirov guy. I'm the guy that sees the good in everybody. He ate my cupcake. I couldn't see. I, cu I, couldn't, I couldn't see. I couldn't see. There was no Likrasam. There was no Ayaris Likrasam. He did I'm an olive. You didn't do what I wanted you to do. You did something. You're on top of me. Get off of me. Get out of here. That was the reaction. This is what the Pasuk is teaching us over here. Unbelievable. The Musr, every word in Tyra, people don't realize that. All the psychology, all the relationship books. <laughs> waste of time. This is where it's at. This is where it's at. If you can't find it here, then you got to go buy books. But this is where it's at. This is just from... One plastic that says vaya 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 vaya. One plastic, but this is very important because this is the reason that we read we read Rus. We're going to get to it in a minute. All right. So vaya is the kasa vayistachu artsa. Remember that he bowed down. Remember these words. Vayaymer adenai im no matzot zichem beinecha. He said, "My master, if I find favor in your eyes." Now he's talking to the malachim and he's calling the malachim his master. No, Avram's the master. Avram's the father of all the goyim. Hamoyin goyim. Why is he calling three Arabs who stink, who are coming out of the desert, right? The Gemara says one was dressed as a merchant. These weren't uh, Saudi Arabian, you know, princes. These were low-life Arabs coming out of the desert. Why are you bowing down to them, Avram Avinu? And what's this? Adonai, my masters. They're not your master. You're the master. They're coming to your house. And the answer is, Avram Avinu realized that if you do chesed for someone else in the next world, who's the master and who's the servant? In the next world, you're going to get rewarded that that guy needed help. So he's your master. Your schus in the next world is because of him. So he said, in this case of you giving me a chance to do chesed, you're the master. Because I'm the one getting the mitzvah. You know Avram Avinu, where he was? How he looked at doing chesed? Imagine if someone rang your bell for tzedakah, collector on Sunday, when you're having tea. And the bell rings. And this time you're nice enough not to tell your kids, to tell them, my father's not available. Or well, one of my friends once did. He says, my father's not home. I'm like, Yaka, Yankee, that's you. I rang the bell and he said, who is it? And I said, Sudoku as a joke. And he goes, my tata's nicht in the heim. I'm like, dein tata? Dein tata's nicht in the welt. It was my friend answering the thing. He was telling him his tata's not nicht in the heim. So imagine... Just try to imagine this, that you got up. Imagine if your kids saw this. Someone's ringing the bell on Sunday. You get up from the kitchen table, and you open the door, and there's a mashulach collecting. He's got 14 kids in there to throw, and now he's marrying off his 15th child. Never understood that one. But okay, right? 
and and they're all your Simon. But he's alive and his wife's alive. I don't know. Anyway. So you bow down. If I find favor in your eyes, please allow me to give you tzedakah. Please come inside. Don't go to the next neighbor's house. I want you to eat lunch. I want you to have food. That's how Avram reacted. Avram said to them, You are my master. I'll know Savor. Please don't go past the house. You have to stay here. Imagine if we brought up our children, that's what they saw. So Avram Avinu is telling them, I'll know Savor Malvadech will remember these words. Do not pass. Do not, do not leave my house. Stay here. You Mayim, take some water. And then of course he's running. He's running to get food. Then the Pasik says, Avramavinu actually served them. Well, who I made Alehem? He was the waiter. Him and Yishmal were the waiters. But it actually says he was the waiter. Tachas ate by Yechelu, they were underneath the tree and they ate. Now these were Middle Eastern Arabs, and this is not the way it works. The man is not the waiter. The wife serves the food, not the husband. So they asked them, I don't understand. Where's your wife? Like, why are you serving? You should be sitting here and eating with us. Why are you serving? So Ramavina said, in my house it's different. In my house, the woman does not serve. It's not sneez, it's not snua for a woman to serve. And therefore, a Jewish woman belongs inside the house. And the Torah tells us that where was she? They said, um, um, they said that next year she's going to have a baby. She never left the oil. She stood at the doorway of the oil. Now why is this important? This is very important. Because we know that three Malachim came to do four jobs. One to heal Avram, one to save Lot, one to destroy Sodom, one to tell Sarah she's going to have a baby. But we also know that a Malach can only do one job. So how could it be that three Malachim got four jobs? So Chazal say, saving Lot and healing Avram, they're both sort of the same thing. Okay, you can't, you know, I remember hearing that as a kid, I'm like, alright. But I heard unbelievable shots. Truthfully, Lot was not supposed to be saved. Lot was supposed to die. Lot was a Russia. Lot lived in Sodom. Abraham Avinu saved him once. There was no reason to save Lot. The only reason that Lot was saved was because Lot was going to have a child called Moab. From Moab was going to come Rus. From Rus was going to come David Amelech. From David Amelech was going to come Mashiach. And therefore, Lot had to be saved. But, there was a halacha that Moab can't marry into Klai Yisrael. So that means Rus also can't marry into Klai Yisrael. So if Rus can't marry into Klai Yisrael, there's no Oive Yishai David. There's no reason to save Lot. So listen to what happened here. Three Malachim were sent for three jobs. Destroy Sodom, heal of Avinu, and tell Sarah she's going to have a baby. There was no Malach sent to save Lot. Now, Malachim came, they did their jobs. He healed Avram Avinu. Now, this Malach asks Avram Avinu, where's your wife? And Avram Avinu paskins a halacha, and he says, a woman is not supposed to serve. She's supposed to cook. She's not supposed to serve. When he paskin that, in Shemayim, whatever we paskin here, they paskin there, they say, well, if that's the case, that a woman is not supposed to serve, then Moab was only punished not to become part of Klai Yisrael because they didn't come out to give the Jews food. But according to Avraham Avinu, the women of Moab were not supposed to come out and give food. So therefore, a Moabia, a woman from Moab, should be allowed to marry into Klai Yisrael. And therefore, they passed in the Shemayim that Moavi, the low Moavia, that a Moavi can't marry into Klai Yisrael. But a Moavia could get married to Klai Yisrael. So at that point, the Malach that was sent to heal Avram got a new shlichus. 
He didn't leave Shemayim with that shlichus. When he left Shemayim, she was a Moavi, a Moavist, didn't make a difference. But now that he passed in this halacha, now a Moavist was allowed to marry into Klaistro. Therefore there would be a Rus, therefore there had to be a Lot, therefore he had to be saved. What was the basis of this sock? That a woman has to be a Tznuah. So now, Chesed should be Chesed, which was Avram Avinu, because he was not Chayv in doing Chesed, because he was a Chayle, he was sick, brought that these three Arabs who were Malachim would come. Because the three Malachim came, Avram, when he was asked, where's Sarah, passed in the Halacha, which made a Moavis legal to marry into Klai So what brought to Malchus Sheba Malchus? What brought the Malchus of David HaMelech, the Malchus of Moshiach to this world? Chesed Sheba Chesed. So the first step in the stairway to get to Malchus Sheba Malchus had to be Avram Avinu's Chesed Sheba Chesed. And guess what? The Chesed Sheba Chesed that Avram did with the Malachim was on Pesach. When we start with the Chesed Sheba Chesed. So that's where it had to all start. It had to start with Chesed Shebe Chesed, and into that mixture came this halacha of Tznuah. That a woman has to be a Tznuah. Okay. Now, let's take a look at Megillah Asrus, which I think is such an important three psukim, which is the most important lesson in a relationship between a husband and a wife, father and his children, mother and his two children, and definitely teachers. So it starts off the opposite way. Disaster. Disaster. Elimelech is a shayfet. He has all the money. The opposite of Avram Avinu. He's not giving any tzedakah. He's going to Moab to make sure that nobody gets tzedakah. Right? What happens? So we all know the, the sons die. Elimelech dies. And... Rus, which is very, very interesting, which I'm going to tell you a story that I did not say in, in Stanford Hill. Rus, Dafkaba. Rus doesn't let go of her mother in law, but Arpa, she kisses her and she hugs her, but she leaves. So listen carefully. But time in Naomi, Naomi says Lishtei Kalaseha to her two daughter-in-laws, Leichna Shevna Ishel Beis Ima. Go back home. Hashem Yimachem, Hashem will be with, with you. So, Ratishak Lehem, she kissed them. Ratisena Koyla, Ratifchena. They raised their voice and they cried. But Taman Allah, and both Arpa and Ruth said to her, Ki Toch No Shivla Mech. No, we want to go. We want to go with you back to Klai Yisrael. Now listen carefully. But term in Ami, Ami says, Shaivna bin return my daughters. Lama Telachna Imi, why are you going with me? I don't have any more children, you're not gonna get to marry anybody. Now it says that the one that listened was gebenched. And the one that didn't listen was cursed. It was the other way around. The Ami told them to go home. Who listened? Arpa. She got cursed. She had Goliath. The one that didn't listen, the one that didn't listen, she got benched. But the Lush and the Gemara is the opposite. The Gemara said, the one that listened got benched. The one that didn't listen, didn't get benched. It's not true. Rus didn't listen. Rus did not go back. Arpa listened. So it, so it sounds like it's totally wrong. So I just heard tonight, the Rav that, that I spoke in his shul, so he said over, he said, no, you dick. He said, what did she say? She called the two of them her daughters. So the Gemara is saying like this, the one that listened and heard the word benoisai, and heard that she was being called a daughter, she understood that even though she was being told to return to her am, um, a mother, Someone who calls someone their child doesn't really mean it. Means leave, but come around the back door and come back in. Rus was the one that listened. She heard the word, Benaisai. She heard that Naomi was calling her a daughter. 
So she understood that what she really meant, even when a parent throws the kid out of the house, they want the kid to come back. They want the kid to beg to come back. So when she heard the word benoisai, she said, she's just telling me this to make me comfortable. But if she's calling me her daughter, she really wants me to come back. So the one that listened got kebenched. The one that heard the word benoisai got kebenched. The other one that wasn't listening, that didn't hear the word benoisai, she taka got cursed, she taka left. Big vart. Big, big vart. Okay? And it, it fits right in. It fits right in. So, I want to tell you a story. No, we took a story. I said it over the Shabbos. It says, Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. The Rus Rus held on. And the Mephoshim say, you, you see the difference? She kissed her, she hugged her, and she left. Rus did not let go. The difference between the two is very little. One held on for a while, for a while, for a while, and then walked away. That was Arpa. And it says that that night she was with a thousand men and a dog. That night. And Goliath was, Goliath was conceived that night. In fact, Goliath, when David Melech came to him with a stick, Goliath said, what do you think, I'm a dog? You think I'm from the dog? If you look at the Mepharshim, he was telling David Melech, you think my mother, Arpa, my mother, got pregnant from the dog? Did you come at me with a stick? He was very insulted. So she went off the derech. Forget about it. And Rus, we know what happened. The difference between holding on just for that extra second. That extra second. That extra second in shul before you run out. You know they make that joke. Kadash Yasam, Kadash Rabbanon, right? Kadash Shalim. Kadash Shalim is after Avshrei Volatzion. Everybody's still in shul. Kashdurabanan, at that point, by Enkelokeinu, only the rabbis are left. After Elenu, the rabbis are not even there anymore. It's just the assignment. It's Kadash Yasam. We running! Work is a curse! Where's we running? Ask somebody who's running out of shul. Where are you going? I'm going to work! I gotta go! Fool! You know what you're saying? You're going to the curse! Because Boku who cursed us. What's the curse? Do you have to go to work? It's to rush. It's an error. It's a curse. The bracha is to say it's Joel and Davin. Everybody's flying out the door. Here I come, curse! You're waiting for me! I gotta get there fast! We don't think. Everybody's running out the door. Dafka boy, stay a couple extra minutes. Say a couple extra words to Kosh Baruch Hu. Not gonna hurt. The difference between Dafka boy and running away. So I want to tell you a story. I had a Shabbat told this, this week for 30 girls that mom is struggling, not their fault. They've gone through terrible tzaras in their life. Terrible tzaras. And they're, and they're struggling. And they're struggling with Hashem. They're struggling with Amuna. They're struggling with a lot of things. So I told them this story. Please don't go home and tell it to your wives because they're coming tomorrow night. We don't want to ruin it. But this is a no ridiculous story. So there's a king, and he had this beautiful daughter. And everybody wanted to marry her. All the princes and all the people wanted to marry her. She was like the girl that everybody wanted to get to. So the king didn't know who to give her to. So the king built, the king built a huge tower. Had a thousand steps. But not stam steps. Long, wide steps. And he put her on the top of the tower. And he said, At sunset, we're going to start a race. You have from sunset to sunrise. Whoever gets to the top of the tower, to where the princess is sitting, by sunrise, gets to marry the princess. You can imagine when that went out to the whole country, everybody was very, very excited. And you had thousands of guys came to be there for that sunset, to be able to run up these steps to get to the princess. And as the sun sets, the race begins. Thousands of guys. But these steps are so wide and so steep. And they start trudging up 20 steps, 30 steps, 40 steps. And it's taking them much longer than they thought. And the whole sunrise, sunset is 10 hours. And they're schlepping, and they're schlepping, and some of them are at the, at the 100th, and the 150th, and the guys that can't breathe anymore, they're like, I can't do it, but you know what? 
I don't even think there's a princess up there. I think the whole thing's just a, just a joke. You know? The, the, the king thought it would be very funny. You know? He's not putting his princess up in a tower. So they turn around, they walk down. But there are other guys that are like, they're in good shape. They keep going, they keep going. But they're only at the 500 step, and there's only like a couple of hours left, and they realize it took them already eight hours to do 500 steps. It's going to take them another eight hours. The sun's going to come up. They're not going to get anything. And they're thinking to themselves, the king wants to make fools out of us. The sun's going to rise. He's going to be sitting there at the bottom, laughing. Look at all these guys stuck. Nobody's going to get the princess. So like, the king set this whole thing up. It's mamish, not true. And all of a sudden, you know how the rumors go? People start talking, this one heard it, this one. Oh, the whole thing's a lie. Somebody found out from the king it's a lie. It's a fact that it's a lie. And everybody starts running back down, running back down, running back down. But there's still a couple that believe. And they keep trying, they keep trying. At the end of the day, there's two left. And they're at the 800th step. And there's about 10 minutes left to sunrise. And they look at each other and they're like, the guy says, he knew we couldn't make it. We are going to look like such idiots. Everyone's going to be at the bottom watching. There's going to be two fools on the 800th step. And the king's going to scream up, suckers! Fools! He said, I am not going to be embarrassed in front of everyone. I am going to the, I am running down these steps. I am running to the bottom. You want to stay up here alone? You can stay up here alone. I am not. And he says to his friend, listen to me. You came up eight hundred steps. It's just the two of us. We'll figure out what to do. Come on, don't give up. And he says, you are such a fool. You got ten minutes. Come run with me down the steps. He's like, I worked this hard. I know the king. He is not a gamer. He is not playing games with us. If he set this up, that means that we could somehow be at the top of this tower in 10 minutes. He says, what are you talking about? We have 200 steps left. He says, I know, but the king would never set up something that, to failure. He says, we have nine minutes left. I am not going to stay. And he turns around and he runs down the steps. And his friend sits down on the 800th step and he says, I can't believe he's running down the steps. But maybe I am a fool. Maybe now I'm the only one left. Everybody ran down the steps. And here I'm going to be the only one on the steps. Everyone's going to turn. I'm never going to get a shidduch. All the girls are going to be laughing. Look at this fool. He didn't have enough brains to run back down. But I know the king. This is not like him. I got to do my best. Eight minutes left, I got to do my best. And he steps on to the next step, the 801st step. And when he steps onto that step, all of a sudden, the steps in front of him open up. And out from the steps comes an elevator. And he looks at the elevator, the door opens, and he gets inside the elevator, and there's one button. P. Not penthouse, but princess. Depending if I'm talking to men, it's princess. If I'm talking to women, P works also. It's prince. So it works. And he pushes the button. This elevator zips, zips up the steps. He gets to the top step, the elevator door opens, and there she's sitting, this beautiful princess, mamish, as the sun begins to rise. He steps out of the elevator. And at the same moment that he steps out of the elevator, his friend steps off the last step on the bottom. And he walks in, and this is the sad part of the story. And sitting next to this beautiful princess is her twin sister. And he says, oh my gosh. If he would have just listened to, him, to what I was saying, we would have both gotten a princess. The king would never set us up for something that's an absolute failure. If I could have just got him to take one more step. Look where he is now. All the way at the bottom with nothing. 
Berus Dafka Bo. Rus understood. Amech Ami. Elokayach is your, your nation is my nation, and your God is my God. And even though Naomi was saying it's impossible, I can't have any more children, Rus said, There's a God in the world, there's a Kleistro in the world, this is what I want. Somehow it's going to work out. And Arpa said, Bye bye. Kiss and a hug and stepped off the elevator. And Rus got the prince. And Rus got Malchus. And Rus got Dabra Melech. And Rus got Melech Moshiach. Because that word, Dafka, is a huge word. It means to hold on when things are not looking good. When we begin to doubt. But if you know the king, if you know HaKadosh Baruch Hu, if you have a connection, a relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you know that he never sets you up. Even though it looks like there's 200 steps left with 8 minutes. It can't happen. He's got an elevator in there. He's got a way for you to make it. It looks impossible. But he's gone. And he runs the world. And he's got all the buttons. So you have to realize that even if it looks like it's impossible, don't be an ARPA! Don't give a hug, a hug and a kiss and walk away! Be a real Dafka boy! Stick it out! As hard as it is! Look at the reward! The Malchus of Klai Yisrael! The Melech HaMoshiach! Because she understood your God is my God. And your nation is my nation. And therefore there's got to be some secret elevator in there. There's got to be something that's going to get me to the top. The Kachoya. There was. So I want to end with a very important lesson from Rus. And why we read Rus, and if her name was Miriam or Hannah, we'd still read Rus. The following. Boaz was the Shafate. Boaz was the head of Klai Israel. He was the richest in Klai Israel. He was the Reish Bezdin. He was the Gadol Ador. He was the Rav Moshe Feinstein, the Rav Chaim Kainevsky, the Satma Rebbe. He was the Gadol Ador. He was the man. He was the Paisik, the head of Bezdin. He was the man. He was an old Tzaddik, if, if you can imagine. He was respected by all. And he was very rich. And he had many fields. And he comes to his field. And it's a lesson for all of us. And what happens? What does he say? He comes to his field to his workers. What does he say to them? No! Were you here on time? Did you get the harvest done? Come on, let's work! Like, what do I say when I come to the office? No! You print that, you, do I have all my printouts on my desk? You got here at 9.20, don't give me the parking baloney. Then you have to leave a little bit earlier. Are you prepared for today's work? How come we don't have the bank statements? Right? You ask all these questions. You come to class? What's the first thing the Rebbe says to the kids? Take out your homework. Put away your food. Tuck in your shirt. Take out your pencils. What's the first thing a Gadol Hadar says to his workers? So the Torah tells us. He came from Beislechem by Yaimar and he said like Kaitrim to his workers. Hashem imachem. God should be with you. What did they answer? You should be benched. What a relationship. Imagine you come into your office in the morning, you have ten workers, two workers, one worker, one secretary, five workers, doesn't make a difference. And you walk into the office and you're the boss, and you walk in and you say, Workers, everybody, Maishi, Chaim, Miriam, Sarah, God should be with you today. So the first thing they're going to say is, Oh, you heard Ray Wallace in speech? <laughs> Imagine you say that to your workers, God should be with you, and they answer to you, you're the boss, Hashem should bench you. What an unbelievable day that office is going to have. Could you imagine a Mora or a Rebbe walking in to a classroom, and the first thing he says to the Kindalach, 
Kindalach, before the homework, the papers, the food. I want to give you a bracha. Hashem should be with you today. And you're learning, and you're eating, and you're playing. Whatever you do, Hashem should be with you. And I don't care if it's a first grader or a twelfth grader. And the kids turn around to the Rebbe or the Mora and say, you should be a bench teacher. Yerecha Hashem. Wow! Think kids in that class are going to go off to Derech? You think the relationship with that Rebbe is going to be strained? It's going to be the most amazing class that ever came to that yeshiva. The Rebbe benching the kids? The kids benching the Rebbe? Or how about a, how about a marriage? How about a, a husband walking out in the morning to go to work and turn to his wife and say, Sarawa! Hashem imachem! Hashem should be with you today. And she turns around and says, Chaim! You're going to Kailel! Should be a bench. You're going to work? Hashem should bench you. That's a marriage. He walks out of the house. He comes to Kailel with a smile on his face. I gave my wife a bracha. My wife gave me a bracha. I don't give a shear. Unless I get a bracha from my wife before I walk in. And if it's a shear, a big shear, I call my mother too. I say, I need a bracha. Because if you go into a shear and your wife gave you a bracha, then she's connected to you. We all go to work when we're going to yeshiva. We're disconnected from our spouses for 10 hours a day. She's sitting home. And you're here, wherever you are. So how do you connect? We live separate lives. And the answer is, if you get a bracha, she's going to want to know you had a big meeting. How did it go? How did my bracha go? Did it work? So if the meeting went great, she'll take full responsibility. See, your meeting went great because they gave you a bracha. If it didn't go well, what a shlamazel, even with my bracha, it didn't go well. <laughs> your kids in the morning, your kids in the morning, when they're walking out the door, Hashem Imanchem, from a tati, tell your kids in the morning, Hashem should be with you today. They'll look at you differently. Tati, you should be good bench in what you're doing. Relationship, what a house, what a dream. So Boaz, he did this for workers, for Kaitrim. He was a gadol. That's a gadol. Shlomo Zalman Auerbach. I heard the story from the guy that it happened with. He used to take Shlomo Zalman when he was 60, 70, when he was older. He used to take him home after second seder to eat to supper. Shlomo Zalman had a little napkin. And in that napkin, he had a piece of sponge cake. And Rav Shleim Zalman would always make a mezoinus on the way home and eat the sponge cake. So this guy, who I know very well, once had the chutzpah to ask Rosh Hashiva, I don't understand, everyone knows you're not supposed to nash before meals, before supper. Why is Rosh Hashiva eating? You're going home for supper. Why are you eating cake? So you know what he said? He said, I'm older and I come home very hungry. And if I come home very hungry, I don't feel I'm going to give my rabbits in the right respect. I'm going to be rush her, I'm going to rush her to eat, I'm not going to talk to her first. This way I eat this piece of cake, it satisfies my, my immediate hunger. I come home, we talk, she doesn't have to rush with the food. She says, that's why I eat a piece of cake. It's a gadol, it's a boyaz, it's a gadol. So he's eating cake so that he's not starving. I mean, we know the story with him when he used to clean off himself, tell his, his boys, they said, why are you cleaning yourself before you walk into the house? He said, the Shekhinah is there. They said, the Shekhinah is there, the Shekhinah is in Yeshiv. He goes, no, my Rebbe's in. It's a different look. It's a second Vayar. It's not just this woman that I married. There's a person in that woman that you married. A person with feelings. And a person with sensitivities. And there's a person with sensitivities and feelings in that child that's your son and your daughter. That second look t tells you something very different about your child and about your wife. That was the godless of Avram Avinu. That was the godless we're about to see of Boyaz. He walked in with a bracha. And he walked out with a bracha. So the next Pasik. So he asked the head Nah, the one who was running the whole field. Lemi hanara hazois. Who is this girl? She's different. Everyone bends over when they pick up the wheat. She curtsies. She's a tznuah. What's going on over here? Kasha. Where did you become a tznuah from? She's a Moavia. Moavia were the worst as you see from Arpa, the worst, most immoral girls in the whole world. 24,000 Yidin died, right, in the Magaifa because of the Moavi girls. Where did this girl, every Jewish girl was bending over, she's curtsying, where did that come from? 
She didn't go to Beis Yaakov. There's a machlek in her whole geiris, right? Where did this come from? So if Shimshim Pika is all of a shalom, this is spiritual DNA. He says, where did Rus come from? Rus was, was ne- would have never been born because Lot would have never been saved and there would have been no Moab if it wasn't for Sari Menu's snua of being in the Oihel. So the whole Mahus, the whole creation of Rus was based on Tznius. So how could she not be a Tznua? She wouldn't have been in the world if it wasn't for Tznius. So how could she not be a Tznua? So if a mother and a father are Tznuim, it's not just on a woman, it's how you talk and how you walk and how you act. If a mother and a father are Tznuim, then the child cannot be not a Tznua. Because the whole creation, the whole conception of the child is from two people who are Tznuim. That's called spiritual DNA. So she didn't even know why she was a Tznua. She never went to Beis Yaakov, she never went to Halachas. She was a Moabi girl, the daughter of, 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 of a Moab king. Look what happened to the other one. Look what happened to Arpa. And the answer was, because Rus, why wasn't, the Shilas, why wasn't Arpa like that? Because Rus was the chosen. She was the one that was chosen. She was Dufka, but she had a choice. Arpa could have been there. If Arpa, if Arpa, would, if Arpa would have stuck. But she didn't stick. She gave up on the 800th step, not knowing that the next step was the elevator. We're all in this room. We don't know what the next step is. I can tell you in my life, pushed and I pushed, and I got to that step when everyone said I couldn't. When my Rosh Hashiva told me that I'm going to end up as a sewer rat. Because they, talk, they caught me talking to a neighbor, a girl. So they were going to throw me out of Yeshiva. So the Yeshiva called me and he said, Wallenstein in 10th grade, you're going, to be a, you're going to grow up to be a sewer rat. I'll never forget when he said it. And now, the Yeshiva calls me every single year to be guest of honor. Because now I'm Wallerstein. And he tells everybody, look what the product that our yeshiva puts out. And I want to say, yeah, big rats. <laughs> so they ask me all the time, can you be guest of honor? Can you, can you be guest of honor? And I, I say, no, I don't do that, whatever. And I'm dying to tell the Rosh Yeshiva, I would love to be guest of honor, but when I come up to speak, what am I going to do with my tail? <laughs> Where am I going to hide it? It's going to be so embarrassing. But my father was showing me, pushed me, and he pushed me, and I finally hit that elevator. He didn't let me give up. He didn't let me turn around and, and, and make a judgment call on everybody and just give up. He pushed me, and he pushed me, and finally stepped on that, on that, on that, on that step. And then everything happened. Everything opened up. The doors opened up. Everything opened up. So anyway, so Boaz asks the head foreman, "Who is this girl?" Why is he asking? Because she's more tznius. So you would think this guy would answer, Wow, she came from Moab, and she's like more tznius than all the, all the yeshiva girls. That's what he should have answered. But he didn't have a second vayar. He only had a first vayar. So what was his answer? What, who is she? So he says, Nara vayaviyahi. She's a low life. She's a Moavia. He has Shava in the army. She's the one that came back from the army because she married a Jewish boy. He died. Look what she caused. The Stay Moab. She comes from the lowest place in the world. The Stay Moab. The enemy. The enemy camp. He didn't have one nice word to say about her. And the only reason Boaz asked him about her because she was different because she was a Tznuah. He only had one look. She's an Isha Moavia and the Medrash says... They wanted to take her and literally, physically, throw her over the fence. Because they said to her, you are a guy. Get out of here. How dare you collect tzedakah from Jewish girls? How dare you collect like it? And they were going to physically take the great-grandmother of David Amalek and throw her over the fence because they only had one look. How do we know this? Because in the next passage, what does Boaz says to Rus? He says... Don't worry. I told all my boys, they shouldn't touch you. These were yeshiva boys. They were shaming the gear. Why would they touch her? What is, he, what is he telling her? Don't worry, I told my boys not to touch you. They weren't going to touch her. Says the Madrish, he was telling her, they threatened, they're going to throw you over the fence. Don't worry, I'll make sure they don't. They're going to throw her over the fence. Because they only had one vayar. 
So what happens? So he gives this report. Imagine a shidduch report like this on a resume. He's asking information. Boaz happens to be for a shidduch. He didn't realize it at that point. He's asking information, and all he's getting is negative. Moavia came back with Naomi, loser, no money, nothing, empty, from Moab. He had nothing nice to say. So the Galadah Adosh should have said, Moavia, okay. You know, let her collect and let her get out of here. What does he say? This is the secret. And Boaz says to Rus, Haloi Shamat, listen to me. BT, my daughter. He called Rus his daughter. Because he called Rus his daughter, Rus became his wife. He called her his daughter. His report was that she's a Movia, she's a lowlife, and he was able to open up and call this girl his daughter. So he calls her a daughter. Listen carefully to what he says. I'll Don't go into anyone else's field. What does that mean? Don't go into anyone else's field. It means you should stay in my field, right? Then he says, the gam, and also, so he's adding to don't go to anyone else's field. Don't leave this field. What's he saying? He told he, he said already, don't go into anyone else's field. What's the vagam? So look back at Avram Avinu at the DNA. What did Avram Avinu say to them? Exactly the same thing. Stay here. And then he, he said extra, loy savor. Same words. Don't pass, through my, don't pass through my house. The same exact words that Avram Avinu used. Chesed shebe chesed. At this point, the malchus shebe malchus. Boaz used the same words. Begam loy savor mizeh. And then he says... First thing is go get water. Exactly what Avram Avinu said. The first thing he told the Malachim was go get water. It's mamish DNA, spiritual DNA, but it's more than that. It's, it's history repeating itself. So when you talk to a kid, when you talk to someone who has low self-esteem, who feels unaccepted, who feels different, and you call that person my daughter, or my son, then you have created an unbelievable relationship. You just broke down all the barriers of low self-esteem. Remember what it said about Abraham Avinu? And she fell on his, her face, he fell on his face. If you look at the relation by Abraham Avinu, same words, same words. But time I love it. I've heard this question many times in my life. Why are you talking to me? I'm a kid on the street. I got nose rings. I got piercings. I'm not dressed nicely. Why are you talking to me? Why are you giving me any attention? Where's the, why are you giving me acceptance? That's the big word he says. She says, Why do you why do you why do I find favor in your eyes? I'm a Moavi. Everyone thinks I'm a low life. Lahakirani, and you're giving me the biggest thing that a person needs, whether it's a wife or a husband or a child or a worker. The big word, Lahakirani, you're giving me recognition. You're giving me acceptance. She said, Why are you giving me recognition? I'm a guy. I'm a stranger. Why, Rabbi Wallstein, are you talking to me? I don't even keep Shabbos. I don't even eat kosher. Why are you talking to me? That was her question. Why are you giving me recognition? Why aren't you like everyone else? Why aren't you walking by and ignoring me? And telling your kids to go cross the street? That was her question to Boaz. So many years ago. By Yad Boaz. There's a beautiful discussion here. And Boaz answers. By Yad Malad, he says, you want to know why I recognize you? You want to know why I'm giving you attention? Who got, who got, it was told to me, everything that happened after your husband's died. What happened after your husband died? You left your father, and your mother, and the home of your birthplace. So he's telling her, you are a Ramavino. 
You're doing the same thing he did. And by Rabbi Vino, Hashem didn't tell him where he's going. Asher Echa, you'll see where you're going. He says the same thing by you. But Teichel Ama Shelo Yadat Etmol Shushov, you're going to a nation you know nothing about. You're an Avram Avinu. Do you hear what's going on here? Two people looked at a girl and said the same thing. The Nash said she's a Moavia. That's why we should throw her over the fence. And Boaz said she's a Moavia. That's why we can't throw her over the fence. Because she's a Moavia. She's greater than we are. She gave everything up to be a Jew. They both had the same look. One difference. He looked at her pain. He looked what she went through to get where she is. And that's what made Boaz different than everybody else in Kalei at that point. Plony Amoni didn't see it. Fool. He would have been the father of David Amelech, the father of Malchus. The day Boaz died, that night when they first got married, the next day, he was prancing around saying, you see, Boaz was wrong. You see, Hashem punished him right away. In Shemayim, they were laughing hysterically. You fool. If you wouldn't have given Rus away, you would have been the Av HaMalchus. The only reason Boaz lived this long was because he became the father. That's why we kept him alive this long. Everybody in class was walking around and judging Boaz and saying, he got what he had coming to him. He married that Moavia. We told him not to. And in Shemayim, they're laughing, you foolish human beings. The only reason he lived this long is from him is coming David HaMelech. So of course he died the next day. Because she conceived a child. How wrong we are, how we make judgment. You see, Hashem proved that we're right. Just the opposite. Just the opposite. Tony Amoni could have been the other Malchus. He's walking around, his kids are like, great dad, if you didn't marry her, you would have been dead. What came from Tony Amoni? Nothing. But he strutted around the next day saying, look at fool, look at Boaz. I told him he should have listened to me. We know nothing. So he says to her, I looked at what you suffered and what you're going through when I see kids in Mechal Shabbos on the corner. Instead of making a judgment call, I'm like, why? Why were you in my son's class and you're not keeping Shabbos anymore? What happened? Abuse? Drugs? What are you suffering? What do you need? You need a job? You need something? You need a therapist? What do you need? Let me be there for you. So the person who takes the first look says, Ugh, oh, Michal Shabbos, keep everyone away from him. I don't want to have anything to do with him. Don't even look at him. That's the first look. The person who looks at the second look says, Why is he Michal Shabbos? He was in my son's class. What did my son have that he didn't have? Let me go talk to him. You don't have to be a Kira specialist. You don't have to be Eshat Torah. You just have to have a faith to cook. You have to have the ability to look a second time. So the final end conversation between the two of them. So he says, Yishalem Hashem Pa'olech, Hashem should pay you back. So now she turns to him, her final line to him. And she says, I know that I found favor in your eyes, my master. Because you consoled me. When you console somebody, that means they're in pain. So she was telling him, I was in a lot of pain. I was not accepted, which is the worst thing that could happen to a person. I was unaccepted. I was looked down upon. Kini Khamtani, you consoled me. So she needed consoling. We didn't know till now that she needed consoling, that she was in pain. So she's telling Boaz, you consoled me. Go Hador, Sadik, you consoled a Moavi girl. How? How did he console a Moavi girl? Because you're the only one that spoke to my heart. Everybody else spoke to me. You spoke to my heart. And I am not even one of your maidservants. And you spoke to my Yitzim and The first look shows you the guf of the person. The second look shows you the lave of the person. When Shmuel came looking for the king, the Malchus, the first person he saw was Yishai's oldest son. He was tall, he was beautiful, he was strong, he was very handsome. And, Yishai, and, and Shmuel and Abi took one look at him and said, 
He's the one. Take a look it up. Look it up in Shmuel. He's the one. And boy, did Hashem give him Musar. In the next Pasuk, Hashem says to him, I don't have it here. Hashem says to him, that's the problem with humans. You see his chitzainius. I, says Hashem, see the lave of the person. This is not the one. And he went to the next one. This is not the one. And this is not the one. And finally, after all seven, Shmuel said, he's not here. You got anything left? And Yishai said, there's Sha'ar, there's one left over. We think he's a mamzer. He's a redhead. And Yishai separated from his wife. And he was supposed to be with a shifcha. And his wife, the Medrash says, bought off the shifcha so that she would be with him. And she became pregnant. And she became pregnant when she was supposed to be separated. So therefore, they thought that she was an Ashish Ish. And that this baby that she's pregnant with is a mamzer. And leave it to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, he's born with red hair! Not one other kid had red hair, they were all black hair! There was a proof that he was a mom's he came from another father. So they took him and they sent him to Beis Lechem! And they put him in the desert! And he was the shame of his family! Nobody talked about him. And the Medrash says that in Beis Lechem, anytime something was stolen, they blamed it on the mamzer, Adboini, that lived in the desert. And it says that David HaMelech, whoever said that he stole, he would pay him back even though he wasn't a Ghanif. He didn't have an easy life. And when David Amalek was brought to the Navi, the Navi looked at this short redhead with a beautiful blue eyes and a beautiful Yafas Mare, not a Gibor. And he said, for sure not. And Hashem said, that's the one. And he got Musa Shmuel and Navi. You only have one look. Because Baruch says, I have two looks. He has the heart of a king. None of the brothers have the heart of a king. And that's where Dawud HaMelech came from. Dawud HaMelech came from Chesed Sheba Chesed. And Dawud HaMelech came from Malchus Sheba Malchus. So when I... Everything that happens in the spiritual world happens in the physical world. When I hurt my foot two weeks ago, when I broke my foot actually, two weeks ago, on the treadmill... So I went right away, that, that day actually, that morning, I went for an MRI. And I had connections in the hospital and I took an MRI. And the results of the MRI were very bad. I have them here. High grade, partial, almost complete ACL rupture. ACL is your main ligament in your leg. You rupture that ACL, you, you got major problems. So the MRI so, showed an almost complete ACL rupture tear of the posterior literal meniscus and the anterior which means I ripped both my cartilages front and back of my knee plus my main ligament which is the ACL mild grade one sprain of your MCL that's the other that's the other ligament and then it just goes on bone contusion tissue edema this was not what I was looking for this is operation big time so, what are you going to do? This is an MRI. Uh, it's black and white. So I called up the doctor, a very good doctor in Queens. And I said, um, I'd like to come see you. I'm hurt, I can't walk. And the doctor said, okay, bring the report from the radiologist in the MRI. And bring me the x-ray. Because they did an x-ray and an MRI. So I came to the doctor's office. And I handed him this, and he read it. Oh my gosh, ACL rupture. MCL rupture. Both your, both your cartilages are gone, you got contusions. He said, okay, we're setting you up Tuesday for an operation. It'll take about a half an hour operation. We're going to do it through three little holes. He said, it'll take a week. You'll, be, you'll do some uh, rehab. I have a wedding, Baruch Hashem, my daughter's engaged, June 25th. By June 25th, you should be able to walk down the aisle. Yay. Okay. So, fine, what am I going to do? It's, it's, it's push it. It's not like, it's not like you need a, a second opinion. Fine. So I get a phone call from my friend that night. I'm very upset. Well, what am I going to do? It happened. And he says, you know, you got to get a second opinion. I'm like, what second opinion? It's printed. It's an, it's an MRI. What's the guy going to tell me? It didn't happen. He says, listen, I just got you in to the biggest in Lenox Hill, which is the biggest sports medicine hospital. Hirschman's his name. 
your mom, all the New York Giant football players, all the biggest football players and hockey players, they are all, he's their surgeon. He's very famous. I got you an appointment with him. I'm like, wow, but what am I going for? He says, well, then maybe let him do the surgery. Let him look at it. Okay. Second opinion, second opinion. So I call up and I say, what would you like me to bring? And they say, bring the MRI. Bring the copy of the MRI. And I said, you want the report? The doctor doesn't really need the report. But if you want, you can bring the report and bring the x-ray. Okay, I come to Lenox Hill. I walk into this room. There's not one person in that room that's shorter than 6'5", 400 pounds. Football players, basketball players, in walks this little Jewish kid with these two shtekid over there. I'm like, hi, 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 please don't sit on me. I only have one boat. You know, it, was like, it was like a scary room. I'm serious. Each guy was like, you big guy. Like, oh, but they get hurt too. So, and this doctor is this little Jewish doctor. This Hirschman, little Jewish guy with big round glasses, you know. Anyway, so they call me into the room. He tells me to lay down. I lay down, he looks at my knee, and he says, interesting. Um, I'm like, well, did, did you read the report? He says, no, let me see the report. I give him the report. He says, ACL rupture, cartilage, your knee's not swollen. If this was true, your knee would be this big. I said, it's an MRI. He goes, I'll be back in 20 minutes. I need to study the MRI. Okay? Kachoya. It's two weeks ago. So, he comes back 20 minutes later. He says, do you ever have an operation on your knee? I'm like, yeah, when I was 16. I was playing ball and I had a big operation because in those days they didn't do this little oscilloscopy. They mamash opened you up. It's 40 years ago. He says, what did they do for you in that operation? I'm like, I was a kid, but I remember they took out my cartilage. He says, let me tell you something. Everything on this MRI happened to you when you were 16. That ACL rupture, that's 40 years old. That cartilage, 40 years old. You've been playing ball on this. You don't, you don't need an operation. That's, that's, not, that's all old stuff. I'm like, well, if that's all old stuff, why am I in so much pain? He said, let me show you. And he takes the MRI and he puts it on the light board. And he shows me in the bone is a stress fracture. The bone cracked in the length of the bone. So it's not like the bone cracked in half, it cracked along the bone, which is crazy painful. And there's nothing they can do. Because a cast keeps two bones together. This is your bone, it's together. It just has to heal. It's stress, it cracks from stress. He says, four weeks, you'll be as good as new. Don't do any exercise, no cold, no hot, no medicine. You should take some calcium at your age because it'll help the bone. That's it. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my goodness, I've been talking about this in share for the longest time. The other doctor, who's a good doctor, said, the radiologist read it? This doctor said, no, 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 no. This is very nice, but this is a radiologist. I need a second look. I want to read the MRI. And he said to me, I want you to know something. You would have had an operation, they would have gone in there. They would have played around with your ligaments, your cartilage, they couldn't have done anything because it ain't there. He said they would have tightened up your ligaments, and guess what? They can't do anything for your bone. They didn't even know you had a bone, and they can't do anything for it. You would be exactly in the same pain that you are, and you would have had an operation for no reason. And I said to myself, I'm sure that's not why he did it to me, but wow, a second look makes the difference between a doctor, a super doctor, a good doctor, and a mediocre doctor who goes by somebody else's look. No Rebbe can judge a kid because another Rebbe wrote a report on that kid. You meet the kid yourself. When a parent comes to talk to you about a child, you don't go by what the parent's concept of the child is, because that's the reality. You meet the child. Don't go by somebody else's opinion. And if you have a child, don't listen to everybody. You want to know if he knows how to learn? You want to know if he has a learning? Disability, you sit with him and learn. Maybe you'll find out that he doesn't have such a disability. You sit with him. You give him the time. That's the one thing we don't give because that's the most precious thing we have. Because you can't live one millionth of a second if you don't have time. You can live without air, you can live without water, you can live without food, you can live without anything in this world for at least two minutes. But you can't live for a second without time. So when we give our wives and our children time, we are giving them the most precious thing that we have, and they know it. They don't want cars and credit cards and all that stuff. Their father could have gotten that for them. That's not why they got married. 
You got married to get time. Your kids want time. Everybody, that's what they want. They want time. And they want us as parents and as husbands to have that chush, to have, to have that second walk. So I know it's very late, and he said we can dial Maiv. We'll dial Maiv at 10 o'clock. I have one more minute I want to tell you something very, very fast. So there's this newlywed couple. They just got married. And in our days, my days, and anyone that's older than me, so we didn't have dryers in the house because they were very expensive and the gas was very expensive. So everybody had clotheslines. I don't know how it worked in London because it's not that sunny here, but, but we had clotheslines. And that's, everyone hung up their vest. Everyone hung up their wash. You know, to dry on these clotheslines. And you had that little thing that you pulled and had these two little wheels at the end. And you know, it was very fun to watch everybody's laundry, you know, going back and forth. So, this Hudson and Kahlo are sitting down to their first breakfast. And, and, and I, I, I made a joke in America. I said, there must have been a Hudson and Kahlo because they're eating breakfast together. All right? So this man got all upset. He's like, I'm married 30 years and I eat breakfast with my wife every day. He got up in the middle of my chair. He's like, you shouldn't say it that way. And I'm like, who makes breakfast? You or your wife? Well, breakfast is really good. I'm like, no, but who makes breakfast? This is a Shalom Meyer speech. Like. Anyway, so she sits down and she looks out the window and she sees that all the wash is filthy. So she turns to her, to her chassan and she says, I don't understand. What's wrong with this woman? She, she's, she hangs her dirty wash outside? Okay. He, the husband doesn't say nothing. Next morning, Nachamo, dirty laundry. So she says, she really doesn't know how to wash correctly. Maybe she needs better detergent. Maybe she needs better laundry soap. Maybe she needs someone to teach her how to do a wash. Why would she hang dirty laundry out? This goes on for a month. At the end of the month, one morning, she looks out the window and she says, Oh my gosh, I don't believe it. Look at this nice clean wash. It's sparkling. So she gets all excited. And she tells her husband, Look, she has finally learned to wash her laundry correctly. I wonder who taught her. So her husband turns to her and says, Who taught her? Nobody taught her. I got up early this morning and cleaned our windows. Ooh, what a story. What a Nayradika story. What looks like dirty laundry when you look at somebody else is your windows, not them. The whole time she's looking at this dirty wash and she's saying, Oh my gosh, what's wrong with this woman? When her husband didn't want to tell her, what's wrong with you? If you just clean the window, her wash is clean. It's your window that's dirty. What a, what a muscle. What an explosive muscle. The second look, if she would have gotten up and gone to the window and looked at her window, she would have realized that's not her wash that's dirty. It's my window that's dirty. Chafetz Chaim says, you have, to walk, you have to clean yourself before you look at somebody else. We see the negativity in other people that is our own. Oh, is that true? Oh, is that true? We see our disabilities when you see someone else. That's our disability. A person who's happy doesn't see anything wrong with anyone. We have to clean our windows first. Then all of a sudden, all the wash becomes clean. The second vayar, everybody. If you have the second vayar, that will bring you to chesed shebechesed, that will bring you to malchus shebamalchus. It's the second vayar vayaratz lekrosam. Maybe if all of us, we have a week left, today was chesed shebamalchus. If we work on it in the next week, that when we look at our spouses, when we look at our children, when we look at each other, it's a, a second look then we'll have this chus emir to Hashem, that by Yaratz Lekrasam, that Mashiach will run to meet us. Bimheri b'yameinu. Amen. We're going to dab in Thank you. Now I'll get down.